Beginning next week, we're going to start a what I think is going to be a four-part series. Now, you'll remember uh, uh, when we went through our last series that we did, I told you, I think it was Colossians we went through. I said it was only going to be like 12, and it ended up being like 19. So I'm not going to say it's definitely going to be four. But I think it's going to be four messages, and we're going to be uh, looking into Acts chapter 11. Okay, and so uh, your homework for this week, Acts chapter 10 through Acts chapter 12. And you might say this, well, how come we got to read three chapters if you're just going to read the middle one? Context, context, context. Okay, and so uh, read Acts chapter 10 all the way through the end of Acts chapter 12. Trust me, it will make a lot of sense when you, when you read before and after. We're going to be talking about what it is to be a contagious church. And I don't mean in a bad way. Okay? Uh, we need to be excited. Yes? yes? Okay. We need to be encouraged, right? And let's face it, there's a lot of things that encourage us. Okay? Um, we, have, we have a family fellowship meal today, Judy. Yes, That's always a good time. How many of y'all are staying? Everybody, raise your hands. Yeah, it's going to be great, okay? And listen, that encourages us, and fellowship encourages us. Helping one another encourages us. You know what? Uh, The thing that should encourage us the most is time well spent with God and His Word, okay? And so I pray that you don't just come to be fed. Okay, I mean, hey, a family fellowship meal is great. Allow yourself to be fed by the Word of God, okay? And so we're going to be talking about some of these things over the course of the next uh, four weeks or so. Uh, Today we want to talk about money, okay? And that seems to be a a rather dirty word, okay, in churches, especially uh, in the last several years. You will uh, read the news accounts about pastors that feel God has called them to go out and get a new jet. Judy, I don't need a jet. Okay. Uh, You know what? Uh, uh, And really, a lot of times when money is talked about, okay, uh, by by, uh, some of these folks, it's all talked about what I can get out of it. Okay? And in one sense, that's true, because we do get blessing when we give to God, but it's giving to God and not to a person. And I'm just going to say it that way, okay? So we need to be very careful as we're talking about money that our basic premise is this. You're not giving to this pastor here. You're not, you're not doing that. You're giving to God, okay? And that is what stewardship is all about. And so even as we are going to be discussing the church over the next four weeks, uh, throughout the year we're going to be talking about some stewardship issues, Okay, we're going to talk money today. Later on, we're going to talk about time. Uh, We're going to talk about about allowing God to plan our calendar and to plan our days. We're going to be talking about what it is to be a good steward and helping others, okay, and in serving others. What does that look like, okay? So uh, just keep in mind that when we talk stewardship, it's not just money, although money is a huge, huge part of worship and praise. Uh, We want to turn the spotlight uh, on God's Word and what it says about money, how we handle it. Like I said, it can be a sensitive issue, but the Bible does have much to say about that. Okay? Before we get started, there's uh, just a, a couple of statements that I think make a lot of sense. The first one is this, money is essential. Today, we need to have money, don't we? It provides homes, food, clothing, cars, what we would call the necessities of life, okay? Uh, In preparation for this, uh, this extreme cold that we have coming this week, if you are going to hit the grocery store, Uh, later on tonight, tomorrow, whenever that's going to be, can I say this? Uh, Take your money with you, okay? Because I can almost guarantee you, if you go on for a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk, they will want you to pay for said loaf of bread and gallon of milk. Money is very essential. It's very important. In the same token, money is also very overrated, I think. 
the world is telling us about how we can get more and more and more. But sometimes it hurts us in a deep way when all of a sudden our dependence falls on what I call the presidential flashcards instead of what, uh, instead of what God wants for you. We have changed our focus and our dependence and it has turned away from God. Our provision is his business and we need to have our dependence on God and not on money. You know what? Money can be used for great good, can't it? It builds hospitals. It feeds the hungry. It clothes people. It provides for the needs of the kingdom. Let's face it, money is good. It can be used to do great things. Luke chapter 10, it talks about the good Samaritan. Okay, and there's a lot of stewardship principles that we find there in Luke chapter 10. Money can be used for great good. Money can also be used for great evil. Money has financed many evil things. The drug culture, pornography, wars, every other practice known to man even as money can be used for good, it can be used for evil. It has been said that money is the grease that lubricates the axle of sin. And I kind of like that. We also know this, money has to be used in the proper way. It must be used properly. As children of God, we have a responsibility to use the resources that we have been given to further God's kingdom here on earth. Money must be used properly. When we place our finances in the hands of the world, we tie our affections to things below and not to things above. Does that make sense? We need to be able to use our money in the proper way. Money can lead to terrible bondage as well. When we, have fall, when we allow ourselves to fall into debt, into the slavery of debt, it hinders our ability to follow the Lord properly. It can lead to terrible bondage. We must be careful. The seventh one is this, and I call this one the no-brainer. Okay, Money must be used to bring glory to God. Whether you eat, whether you drink, whatsoever you do, do all to God's glory. Is what 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says. When money is used properly, it glorifies God. When God is denied the opportunity for us to be dependent on him, when we take our eyes away from him, we forfeit a great blessing. That's why I say this, uh, presidential flashcards, we need them, but don't let that be your God, okay? Don't let that be what controls you. All of this leads to the primary use for our money, and that is this, to bring glory to God. The primary use for money is giving. When we give, we honor God, we advance his kingdom, we demonstrate faith in the promises of God, we expose ourselves to his blessings, and that is something that all of us can do and that all of us can benefit from. So with these thoughts in mind, let's look at uh, Mark chapter 12, okay? And we're going to spend just a few minutes here uh, this morning. Mark chapter 12, uh, verse 41 through 44. I'd like to read that to you. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which made a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty and has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. 
there is a matter of our giving that we see here in verse 41. He sat down opposite the treasury. He watched people putting money into the offering. And then it says this, many rich people put in large sums. Here it is, the matter of giving. Jesus cares about our giving. It's evident from the fact that he watched them put money into the treasury. He was watching them. It said he watched people putting money into the treasury. You know what? God is watching, isn't he? He watches what we give. He knows what we give. He sees that and he knows that. God is also uh, God's challenge in our giving. Now the yardstick has always been the tithe. Okay, uh, I firmly believe that's a yardstick that has not been taken away. There are some pastors that will say, oh, that was Old Testament stuff. Uh, you know what? Uh, that is still the yardstick for giving today, the tenth. God desires every person be involved in actively giving to the Lord. Now, there are three basic reasons why people don't do this. And maybe you've been here at one point or another. Uh, many have never been taught to tithe. Maybe they weren't shown by their families. You know what? For many preachers, they stay extremely silent on the subject of giving. Okay? Uh, I have a pastor friend of mine. He dared to preach a message on giving. And his church always said, you preach the whole counsel of God. One of the church leaders said, you preach the whole counsel of God, but don't preach money. Uh, can I say this? Uh, money is part of the counsel of God. And we need to preach that, and we need to share that. Many misunderstand the place of tithing in the Lord's kingdom. Like I said, there are those that feel uh, we don't have to do that. I would disagree with that. This comes from a lack of understanding about what tithing is and where the concept came from. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. There are also some people that just uh, flat out uh, refuse uh, to obey the Lord and what the Lord says. They choose disobedience and they just refuse to do that. Obviously, giving matters to God. We see that Jesus was watching and, and he was observing all of these things. The measure of our giving, we see in verse 42 through 44, a poor widow. This was a woman who had basically nothing. She put in two small copper coins which made a penny. Okay, What can you buy with a penny today? Nothing. Nothing. If you're going to the store for the loaf of bread and gallon of milk, you're going to need a lot of pennies. A single penny just is not much. It says, he called his disciples to him and said, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. They contributed out of everything that they had, but her out of her poverty, she gave it all. And so I want to give you a little background just so you can kind of Picture, uh, picture this scene here. Uh, Jesus stood there that day. He's watching people give their offerings. He was watching not how they give, but how much as well. And so in the temple treasury, okay, we have offering plates, right? Okay, that, that, and we have a set time where we take up our offering. Uh, in the temple treasury, there were 13 brass chests or boxes that the worshipers would put their offerings into. These chests were called trumpets. They had these big bells, right? And so as people were coming in to put their offering in there, you know what? If you had a lot, clang, 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 it, it made a ruckus. It made a lot of noise. Now, if you're throwing in that much, isn't that how sweet the sound? You know, I'm throwing this in there, I'm throwing that in there, and I'm putting some over here, and I'm running over here, and I'm throwing some over here. Look at me! 
Watch this. If you can't see, you can hear it. I'm throwing in everything. And so Jesus is seeing this. Each test bore a different description of what the money was used for. That was their way of, of Judy having a church budget and seeing where the money went in, okay? And so that is, that is how uh, they kept track of things. Here's the widow. Two small coins. Was there a clang, 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 clang? No. Bing. That was it. That's all the sound effects I got. Bing. It just a little bit. And you know what? For the person that was putting in just, you know, a lot of it and were just, it might have taken a little bit of time. How long did it take this widow to throw these two coins that amounted to a penny? And I'm done. That's all there was. The widow gave all that she had. And when Jesus saw that, he could no longer contain himself. And he used that as an example to all who were present there. Did she give out of abundance? No. She didn't have anything. By the world's standards, she had nothing. But she didn't let that stop her from giving to God. She didn't let it stop her. Let's take that to present day. Let's take that to today. There are some people who, by the world standards, don't have much. God calls us to give. God calls us not to use as an example all of these people throwing in out of their abundance and making a lot of ruckus while they're doing it. He calls us to give. He calls us to give. This widow gave everything that she had. You know what? Didn't seem like much, did it? Didn't seem like a lot. But God blesses that. God blesses that. There's a few principles that we draw from Scripture concerning the measure of our giving, how we are supposed to give. Uh, we are to give proportionally. You know what? We all don't give the same amount. We, we don't. We are told to give the same proportion. Okay? You know, the tithe is 10%, right? Okay, and so uh, we are to give proportionally. God's starting point for giving is 10%. That's called the tithe, and we see that in Malachi chapter 3. We also see it in Leviticus uh, chapter 27. But stop to think about this. So many people, and I had a person tell me this about, oh, probably a year, year and a half ago. Well, tithing was a part of the law. It wasn't a part of the law. 430 years before the law was given, Abraham offered the Lord a tithe of all of his increase. Genesis chapter 14, it says that. And we can even go before that. Abel brought the Lord the first fruits of his flock. Genesis chapter 4, verse 4. The idea of giving to the Lord. Can I say this? It's as old as humanity itself. Okay? Uh, giving didn't begin with the law. It began way back. Genesis chapter 4. Regardless of who you are, your part is the same as my part. We're required to give to the Lord. We are to give properly. There's a proper place that has been appointed by the Lord for us to give our tithes, and that would be the local church. You know, through the years, I've heard people say, well, I tithe, but I don't give to the church I go to. I give to this and this. Okay, I'm not saying you shouldn't give to this and this. I am saying God expects us to tithe to the local church. I think that's biblical. It's right here. 
We see the importance of that. We are to give properly, to bring our tithes into the storehouse, as it says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. God's plan is that the tithe comes here and that kingdom work begins here and is fleshed out here and here and here. We are to give properly. We are to give perpetually. We're to keep on going. 1 Corinthians 16.2 says that we are to make our giving a regular part of our lives. You know what? It's easy to give when times are good, right? Boy, that's easy. But when times are tough, you know what? Maybe it's not always so easy. God's Word tells us that we are to make it a regular part of our lives. We keep on going. We keep on doing. We also see some motives here in our giving. You know what? How many of y'all just love to give gifts at Christmas time? Isn't that great? Yeah, I, I like doing that. Uh, we had our, our kids and grandkids over. Uh, this was a week before Christmas. And you know, we, uh, we had a Christmas tree in our house and, and man, there was so many presents under there. And 99.9% .9 of them pearly were for the grandkids. That's okay. And we had so much fun and just watching their face. And, and our grandson is now to the point, it used to be he loved the box more than what was in the box. Okay, now he likes the stuff. Okay, and you know what? It was great. Karen and I, we just sat back and we just grinned ear to ear. And they left and a few hours later, I, my face hurt. <laughs> uh, the smile was still there. We love to give. You know what? We should love to give to God. We should love to be able to worship God in that way. He sat down opposite the treasury. I'm going to read uh, verse 41 through 44 again. He watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came in, put in two small copper coins, which made a penny. And he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. They have contributed out of their abundance, out of everything that they have, but she out of her poverty has put in everything that she had, all that she had to live on. You know what? There's a motive that goes to how we give, when we gave gifts to our kids and our grandkids at Christmas. You know what? We gave because we love them. And we enjoyed time with them. Now for us, Christmas kept on giving, didn't it? Because we got to have the kids that whole week of Christmas. That was kind of unexpected and it was great. And we got to spoil them rotten even more. Pearly, then we got to give them back. <laughs> but not before we loaded them up with sugar about 20 minutes before. No, we didn't do that. You know. But we were able to enjoy them. As we give, we are to give that same way. You know what? We should give thankfully. We should give thankfully. Considering everything that the Lord has done for us, we should give with an attitude of thanks. A thankful heart is going to be a giving heart. Scripture also says that we should give cheerfully. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says uh, that uh, God loves a cheerful giver. In the Greek, that word cheerful is hilarious, and you've heard me mention that. We are to give hilariously. Uh, how many of y'all just like a good joke? If you do, don't ask Scott, okay, because his are awful. Okay, every morning he sends me a, a message, right? I want to say I look forward to them, Scott, I do not, uh, because I know I'm going to groan, but yet I know it's going to come, okay? Um, and so he will send them to me via a text message. Uh, I don't know, how would you like to wake up to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, you know... And sometimes I just groan. I just, oh, he did not do that. Oh, they are awful. They are bad. 
But then he's had some that, that, that are pretty good. There was one, and I can't even remember what it was now, but it stuck with me throughout the day. And Judy, whenever I thought about that, I was sitting at my desk, I just chuckled. I was so glad nobody else was here that day. See, y'all would have thought I was nuts. But Scott, one out of a hundred, not bad, okay? Uh, it was hilarious. It, Oh, um, Karen would like to be added to that list. Okay. Um, here's the thing. Uh, we are told that we are to give out of a sense of hilarity, that same, that same uh, feeling that you get, what it is that makes you happy, what it is that brings you joy. We are to give in that way. We should give cheerfully. We shouldn't give because we're obligated to. We Give, not because we have to, but because we get to. Okay, we give cheerfully. We should also give liberally. And what that means is this. We shouldn't be stingy uh, when it comes to giving to the Lord's work or to his people. Okay, in light of what God has done for us. Okay, there's a saying out there that says you can't all give God. That's absolutely right. We should give liberally. We should not be stingy when it comes to doing that. We should give sacrificially as well. In our text, uh, Jesus was impressed not by the amount of the widow's gift, but rather by the fact that she gave out of her great need. The rich gave out of their surplus. She gave everything that she had. And can I say this? It wasn't the amount that got the Lord's attention. It wasn't the amount that Jesus was looking at. It was the attitude of giving out of sacrifice. If you wait to start giving when you have plenty, there are two problems that make themselves known. You never get to where you think you have enough, right? When you do have extra, it will seem like too much to give. So boy, talk about being stuck between a rock and a hard place. Scripture tells us not to put strings on when is enough enough and when is too much too much. Scripture says simply to give. And again, that yardstick being the tithe. Now, let me ask a question. Is it okay to give more than 10%? Absolutely it is. Okay? And can I say within this church, uh, we have had so many projects that have gone on and people have just, have just uh, given to get some of these projects done. You all walked through one of them this morning. Okay, uh, I don't know if you saw the foyer area. Boy, that looks fantastic. I'm going to move my office out there. I like that place so much. Okay, but that's because there were some folks who saw a need and just got it done. Uh, can I say praise God for that? Okay, uh, while the, the tithing is the yardstick, Scripture says tithes and Offerings, And we're going to be talking about that uh, a little bit later on when we hit one of our other uh, stewardship uh, emphasis. Uh, we are told that we are to give sacrificially. I think sometimes, sometimes we as God's children, we suffer from a disease called cirrhosis of the giver. How's that? You know... <laughs> Feel free to use that, Scott. He's going to message me that tomorrow. Um, oh, it's cirrhosis of the giver. You know what? Uh, uh, the arm works just fine during the week. Uh, we can get back to that pocketbook just fine, but come Sabbath morning, all of a sudden, that arm don't work. Okay. Scripture tells us and gives us examples of what it is to be motivated to give. Why we need to give. When it comes to the topic of money, uh, there are always those that get just a little bit touchy. 
get a little sensitive to that. And you know what? Um, I understand that. I get that. Okay? Uh, I have heard from a lot of people, not here in this church, okay? but I've heard from a lot of people you know, that say, I can't, I can't, I can't. Here's what I say. Jesus did and did and did. Okay? Let your giving be done as an act of worship and praise to God. What is God's word about your money? <laughs> your money belongs to him. And ultimately, you and I, we will give an account of what we have done with God's provision for us. Let's pray together, shall we? Loving Father, Lord, we thank you that everything that we have, Father, comes from your hand. You are the one that uh, provides for us. You are the one that, uh, that gives us everything that we need. Lord, I pray that out of our need, Lord, that we wouldn't let, let that get in the way of giving to you. Father, I pray that we would give in a way that honors and glorifies you. No matter what we do, it is all supposed to bring honor and glory to you. That includes, Father, our giving back to you. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for providing for us. How can we do any less than to give back to you? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.